All right, welcome, inappropriate Earl Maniacs. I'm going back to my roots, and I don't mean LeVar Burton. I mean going back to my days of wanting to just interview my funny friends to expose them to my white fan base. And I can't think of a closer friend that I should have had on the podcast years ago other than the great Roger Rod. Roger, welcome. Well, first of all, thanks for that very kind intro, and I feel the very same way. Before we get started, I do want to say I met Earl probably about 20 years ago, and uh, he was relatively new at the time. Am I right? Yeah, I think, you know, we've done comedy so long. I don't know about you. I don't remember when I started, but it was probably around 90. Okay. 99. Okay. Yeah, relatively new because it was just shortly after that, but I can see right off the bat he stood out. Brilliant writer, tremendous stage presence, and also a very cool dude to know. So happy to be on this show. I'm like a whore at the White House. I'm just happy to be here. Well, there's plenty of those. Uh, well, I felt the same way about you. I remember, you know, I, I think we, I remember my earliest memories of you were like, I think at Ireland's 32. Uh, right, right. And just going, who is this guy? Uh, you know, be <laughs> It's like, he, and I'm not roasting you. This is honestly what I, like, you look like Don Johnson and uh, a like <laughs> combo of Ryan Seacrest. And like, you had a, you were clearly uh, more seasoned than most of us in that era of the early 2000s. And, uh, you know, we became lifelong friends. So, uh, you know, we've same references. And I think I did a Nick Nolte getting out of bed in North Dallas 40 reference, and you got it, like, uh, you know, because you and I were probably the two oldest dudes on the circuit even back then. Um, so Unfortunately, you are right. Absolutely, you are right. And uh, Earl would always do a lot of – the place Ireland 32 you mentioned, it was kind of like a more of a – a jam session for comics that we were doing material that you can only do for other comics. If you did it in a club, you would die. And we were roasting each other and doing a lot of at the moment stuff. And the, and Earl always came off with the sucker punches that were just the lines of the show. And uh, there were many of them and the cloud Stewart. And I often talk about that. Some of your classics. Well, I think it, I don't know about you, but it hurt me doing those rooms for as long as I did. Cause uh, when I first started getting spots, ironically, not at the comedy store, but at the improv, I, I didn't know how to react when the crowd was listening. Uh, you know, and I, <laughs> like I, there was no comics in the room, so I couldn't do a joke about, I don't know, Boone Shakalaka and get the crowd back. They were like, who the fuck are you talking about? Um, so I, I, I think you told me once, Earl, you're the Dane Cook of shitty rooms. And um, <laughs> like it's a compliment, but it's really not. <laughs> like you know, like I understand yeah. how you meant it, but uh, because you also do something that I wouldn't have had the balls or had the balls to do. You play a lot of black rooms, uh, which is crazy to me. A guy who looks like you and you kill in them. How did you get into playing? Uh, I guess you'd call it the hood circuit. They call it the Chitlin circuit affectionately, but uh, yeah, it was born of necessity more than anything else. Is both of us know very well that uh, this is not a comedy town, LA is a showcase town. And I came here as a six year B room headliner in all the white bread clubs that you would get on the Tribble Donna Richards circuit back in the days of the Kaufman and the tri state areas. And I came back here and I couldn't get on stage anywhere. And I was finding myself back at open mics. And I thought, I've already missed this phase of my game. And as soon as I went into the first black club and was received so well, I said, fuck it, I found a niche. And for the next straight seven years, I played nothing but hood clubs. And I absolutely love playing for black folks because all you got to do is just be funny. Don't be disrespectful. Just be funny. And there is no PC. There is no, you can't say this, you can't say that. The only thing you can't say is obviously one word. But uh, after that, the door's open as long as you don't step over the line. 
yeah, I mean, if you look like you or I and say that word, uh, it better be the greatest joke on planet Earth or um, you better be fast. Uh, get out of that room. Because <laughs> you've seen comics say that word in a black room, white oh, comics. My. And like, what? What was the reaction? Well, you know, really, uh, you can't outdo the performance Michael Richards did. Uh, that's about as, as top of the line of what that word will get you. And when that happened, uh, this just shows you how slimy and grimy the, the mainstream media is. Is when that happened, and those of you that don't know that Michael Richards had a meltdown at the Laugh Factory, the, is your fans pretty much on board with knowing about that? The Kramer incident at the Laugh Factory. Uh, yeah, I mean, I personally thought that was his funniest set ever, but, like, he was a horrible comic. Yeah, that was probably the most reaction he ever got as a comic. But <laughs> oddly enough, that went down. Is it, I was very well aware of why it happened, because that was at the Laugh Factory, and they have a show that's their longest-running, most successful show they call Chocolate Sundays, which is about as inappropriate as you can get. <laughs> but it was a mainly predominant black club on that one night at the Laugh Factory. And I went up there and had a huge set. And I'm not saying that to say I'm the great me, but I got off stage. This was about two weeks before Kramer had that meltdown. And I went upstairs to the top level of the Laugh Factory. And my Michael Richards walked up to me like I was the rock star with this look of amazement. How did you do that? How did you, quote unquote, talk to them like that? And that's when I realized a couple of weeks later, that he had a big, strong fear of black people. And it showed. So that's uh, that's something that I brought up many times for one reason. I will always defend to my death his right to do what he did. As long as you're willing to take the consequences that come along with it, which is A, you just might get a very deserved ass kicking, which he almost <laughs> did. And B, you're going to be a social pariah and lose your career after that, which did happen. But he has the right. To, I don't want to go back to the days pre Lenny Bruce when you get arrested for obscenity on stage. And we're getting closer to that all the time. Well, I think ultimately, <laughs> I don't know how you feel, but like I, you know, like Daniel Tosh a couple of years ago got in trouble for a rape joke at the Laugh Factory, ironically. Um, I think as long as it's funny, you can almost say anything you want on stage and you'll get a pass. Uh, like, I remember uh, one time I was at the comedy store, and uh, I do have a joke about the first time I heard that word. And obviously, it's a horrible word. Uh, and there was a gigantic black dude in the front row. And you know how comics are. They started yelling in the back, hey, Earl, why don't you do your inward story now? And the guy looked at me, and he was probably literally the size of Aaron Donald, uh, just a I don't know who this guy was, but uh, you know he he was a football player of some sort. And he looks at me and goes, "You can do it, but it better be funny." And so it's the only time I've said that word on stage ever. And it's it just uh, I was playing golf. I uh, shot bogey golf on the front nine of Bel Air Country Club, and I ran home and told my uncle. I said, "Uncle." Jim, I just shot bogey golf on the front nine of Bel Air. And he looks at me and goes, Earl, that's golf. And uh, the black guy in front laughed. And I said, hey, I got about 12 more jokes with that word in it. Can I do them? And he's like, no. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I I think in Michael Rich, I almost said Michael Jackson and Michael Richards, that just wasn't funny. Like, uh, it's, it seemed it, like... We came from the heart you know no, what it really came down to is i don't want to say he had that much hate in his heart but i knew he had a fear but what i will say is it was indicative of the way this town works as i said earlier it's a showcase town and a lot of people don't know that that incident at the laugh factory happened on a friday night guess where michael richards was on saturday night right back at the laugh factory it wasn't sure. until that went viral that all of a sudden sanctimonious owner of the club said oh this is terrible we must get rid of this word that's when he made a move on it because yeah. other than that he put up somebody that had a name a star fucker town like we've got but he did not belong on a sat friday night or saturday night show at the left back because he was essentially an open micer yeah and i mean i think 
and he was getting heckled from what I remember about the incident from the uh, the balcony of the Laugh Factory. And I, you know, someone like you or me, even at that time, I could have, I think, handled the Of course. You know. Of course you Because but I. What the situation. I, I know who was there, and I know if I've, I've spoken to the host. The Fraser Smith was the host, and I found a whole backstory on it. And I know how the black culture is, is that if you don't bring the funny right away, they're done. What happened is mid-show, he was on stage not doing too well because he wasn't that funny. And mid-show, a black group came in and sat right on the top balcony. And for a couple of minutes, it was like, oh, hey, look at this. The guy from Seinfeld's on stage. And about three or four minutes into his performance that they watched, they were like, he ain't funny. So they just started talking amongst each other. And so Kramer was on stage getting a lot of crickets. And all of a sudden, he kept hearing this noisy table. Now, if that happened to either you or me, we would know how to handle it. He didn't. He was pissed. He was insulted. How dare you? I'm the great Michael Richards from Seinfeld. Shut the fuck up. And that's all he knew how to do because he wasn't really a seasoned comic. He was an open micer. Quite happened. Well, I think he's, you know, any actor, or not, I won't say any. You know, I've seen it with Jeremy Piven. I've seen it with a few others. They're coming from the acting world where it's, okay, here's your line. You'll get a laugh here. It'll be quiet. Uh, there'll be no distractions. Uh, and so they come from that world to the laugh factory or the comedy store, you know, or any club really, where it's glasses clanking, waitresses moving about comics in the back i don't know doing whatever they're doing trying to get some pussy and uh so that he's not it's like teaching a quarterback how to deal with a blitz but no one blitzes you and then you get live action <laughs> oh shit i'm in trouble um so i just i've never really seen a good actor transition into being a good comic have you to be honest um, not really, because it's so different. Uh, although the only one I would say, I'd hope to say, is me, because I, I, I was, I, I think I'm, I don't think I'm a great comic. I think I'm a good comic. I honestly think I'm a great actor. I was an actor first for a lot of years. And I went to comedy because I thought it would boost my career and all that. It was two fucking heroin habits on that. But I love doing comedy, but I wasn't an actor first, and I still think of the two. I'm far better acting than I am at actually being a comic. Well, you are, you know, I saw your one, uh, one man play footsteps and I was like, wow, this guy really, Roger can act. Uh, so you're <laughs> one of the few, no, I'm being serious. Like uh, you're one <laughs> of the few who can do both. And, uh, you know, you, you know, I remember I did, uh, I think I did the J spot. I was like, I want to do a, you inspired me. I was like, I want to do a black room just to see how I could do. And, uh, I don't know. I, this is a Friday night. <laughs> I did like 10 minutes to complete silence. And the guy who was booking it says, Hey man, you can come back anytime. I'm like, they didn't laugh once. They were dead silent. And he's like, Oh, you should see what they do when they don't like you. And I'm like, I'm good. I don't think I ever played a black room since. Um, I would say after 29 years in black clubs, I have one title where I, I think I'm the GOAT. And that is, I don't think I've ever met a comedian or heard of a comedian that has better bombing or bombed harder than New York is a I was going to the hoodiest hoodie York, and that's where I have had hair thrown at, ash thrown at, chicken wings thrown at. I've been physically attacked four times on stage. Three of them were women. It just never fucking ends when they don't like you there. It's not they don't like you. They would like you. But harder bombing. Where I play. Well, I mean, I think you and I are similar from the standpoint of our appearance scares a lot of people from heckling us. Uh, you know, like when, when I first started playing at uh, in black clubs, Ari Spears before he was famous, 
I was at a spot and I was just starting to kind of cross over and get the new kind of culture that I was trying to perform to. And I was at a place called Maverick's Flat, Fort Southern Crunch. Why are you doing it? The room we want, and you're over here getting it. We want when I get back in, I cannot get into the room. She's talking about, I'm nobody from nowhere. There's a lot of little crap going on here. At least I get it. But yeah, don't you want to say something? When you walk on that stage, you represent everything we hate. You look like the guy that was the high school quarterback. Mommy and daddy bought him a car on his 16th birthday. All the games, front run, baby. never have a hard day in his life. Always be serious coming into our neighborhood trying to get our support. I never forgot that. Well, that's like getting a. Uh... When you get a thumbs up, and Ari Spears is a pretty black comic. Like uh, I, when I think of black comics, I think of him. You know, Corey Holcomb. Uh, you know, Guy Tori. You know, uh, I mean, I remember when Guy. I'd never been so nervous in my life when, because we had kind of taken uh, when we started roast battle. I think Guy had heard about it and go, what's with this shit? Because it was, we crossed the line, I would say, uh, especially me. Uh, and I remember he came up to watch a show once, and he probably doesn't remember this, but he came up to me and was like, hey, man, what's with all the racist cracker bullshit? And I'm like, oh, uh, talk to Moses. He tells me to say all that stuff. And then I ran out of the room. So... <laughs> He was not on board with what roast battle was becoming. Because <laughs> it's... Well, it certainly gave you a good spot where you belong to be in the spotlight and help you get into the store. And, uh, you know, I'm proud of what you've done. There. You've gotten into a spot that the most difficult place. That, that is essentially like the cellar is in New York here in Los Angeles. When you are a regular at the comic store, you've done something. That is a very large tribute. I mean, I was lucky, got, but, you know. That, I remember that. But you posted a picture on social media of your name on the Comedy Store wall, and you said, hell has frozen over. I mean, it was a, a long journey, but, um, you know, and, and you know, Roast Battle, uh, I think I was passed right before Roast Battle started popping off, so I, I can't say Roast Battle got me passed, but... Uh, it was certainly uh, an interesting time at the store, you know, with the uh, talent coordinator getting fired, who had some uh, interesting views on certain elements of society. Um, I know him well. Yeah, I mean, I I think everyone has an interesting Tommy story in regards to that matter. Uh, and then, you know, obviously Rogan came back and then Joey Diaz came back and then. So it was a fun time to be around the store, but um, you know, it's not the end all be all. It's not like I'm super famous, but it, it is nice to be able to invite people you want to see you there. You know, yeah. but, but you know, you're in at the laugh factory. I can't get booked there to save my life. So I'm not in there at all. The laugh factory, the chocolate the Sunday's crew, there's somebody there that really fucking hates me. Uh, well it's probably uh, re Probably because you're funny. Did, did I... <laughs> first of all, Chocolate Sundays, yeah, when I first did it, back when Chris Spencer and Pookie used to book the room, we're talking somewhere around 15, 17 years ago, I did it. And it was Chocolate Sundays, no pun intended. The room was 98% black. And now it's more like Neapolitan Sundays. <laughs> it's a third black, a third mix, and a third white. So it's no longer what it once was. But I went there for the first time a year ago, August, and many, many years. And I had a set. I had two sets. They encourage you to do two different sets, and an eight-minute set and a 10-minute set. And I caught standing O's on both of them. I riffed with the guy that was running the stage very well. And it was pretty much what I would say the kind of night you'd like to have. 
And when it was over, they posted one of my jokes on their Instagram, the Chocolate Sundays Instagram. They posted one of my jokes that I did. And in less than two weeks, it had three and a half million views. That's more than anybody on their site had. And it wasn't a really brilliant joke, but it was a joke that got a lot of attention, a lot of hate, a lot of like, that sort of thing. But nonetheless, three and a half million views is three and a half million views. And what they do is they ask you to do two different sets because they take the best three minutes of that set and then put it on their YouTube page, Shock the Sunday's YouTube page, at which point then you can monetize it. They would make about three and a half million views. They'd make about 100 racks. I would get five or 600, but I would make something. But they would get somewhere around 100 racks if I got that many views that they just would have run it together. So I saw all that, called them up and said, hey, what are we doing? What are we going to put up the three to five minute set? We're not. You're not appropriate for our act. So somebody really fucking hates me there. And what do they mean you're not appropriate? The language or the just that you're white? It, uh, that I'm white saying what I'm saying. And if you're a white straight man, I'm going to beg to differ with you a little bit. Or to me, as far as I'm concerned in America today, if you're a straight white male, you can make fun of you and you alone unless you're either A, extremely overweight, B, gay, or three, you have an accent. You have an accent, you got a license to go up and say what you want. If you're overweight or you're gay, you can say what you want. If you're a straight white man, Watch out. You're on a tightrope. Oh, and I and you and I are uh we don't have to give our age, but you know, we're above fifty, let's just say that. So that's an even a, a more nail in the coffin <laughs> of uh <laughs> you know, straight white, heterosexual male above fifty. I mean you might as well walk out with a white shirt that says the n-word on it just to really drive it home um because it's like I, you can't get any worse a category and like you said you either have to be 400 pounds um you know have a missing arm uh or like have a Burks. speech impediment uh have uh ms or something <laughs> so, oh, okay this guy's or girl it can be a girl too i guess <laughs> they can barely talk let's give them a tonight show like yeah the ideal comedian for leftist hollywood would be a dwarf down syndrome amputee that was mixed race of anything other than white that would be the newest headliner the new matt rice you know i don't know how you feel about matt but i don't hate on the guy just because I remember he couldn't get booked in this town. Uh, you know, the only show he got booked on was his own show at the Laugh Factory. So, you know, I mean, we're all trying to, hell, I hope this interview goes viral. Someone takes a clip of whatever we're talking about and and you and I both blow up. I mean, so I, I, I don't really uh, have a lot of animosity towards him because – you know, in this game, it's cyclical. To me, every 10 years, the general public picks a comic to hate. You know, 20 years ago, it was Dalia, No, uh, Dane Cook, then Dalia, and now yeah. it's Rife. So, right. you know, I mean, he's doing what... Well, like, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. I mean, he's doing what we all... You know, he, he threw out hundreds of videos, one hit. Now he can play anywhere in the country. He can play theaters. It, he can... He probably gives the middle finger to the laugh factor. Like, no, nah, I'm good. You guys barely booked me. Suck it. So I, I don't mind him because he worked hard. I'll give him that. I look at it that I heard a great quote from somebody that I fell out with, unfortunately, but I'll give it. It was his quote that you can either be a comic or you can be a critic, but you can't be both. And I don't criticize any other comics, especially those who are galaxies ahead of where i am right now all i'm gonna look like is a jealous hater that they're where they are and i'm where i am now what i will always defend is their right to say and do what they want and i applaud their work ethic as you just did but what i think of them as a comic what the fuck does it matter he's matt rife household name my name is roger rod and in front of it other words who the fuck is so what am i going to do criticize somebody who's up in the stratosphere well, I remember I was about to go on in the original room 
uh, so I'm waiting in the hallway, you know, just so I can see the comic, get the light and get ready. And uh, Matt was in the main room. He sold out two shows on a Wednesday night, two different crowds too. So it wasn't just like they made the first crowd stay. And, uh, you know, I was like, you know, I got three minutes. I just want to see what, what his act is about. Um, and I go in there and unfortunately for him, I walked in at the moment he had forgotten his joke. And I've done that myself. It happened to me Saturday night. So no hate there. But he had a great save line where he's like, he just kind of stared at the audience and he was like, you know, I think I'll just take my shirt off. And the crowd reacted like the fucking Beatles had walked on stage. So like when you have that kind of audience uh, rapport, you don't have to be funny. Like, No, really don't. It's hard to bomb at that level. It really is. Because people paid to see you. That's why you know, what I've what I've said. I said to a guy at an open mic about a year ago is uh, you, you mentioned it earlier that this guy was saying that he thought I was doing the ballsiest thing there was in comedy by being the white guy that looks like a surfer off the beach playing in black clubs. And then I saw his set and I said, what I'm doing is nowhere near as ballsy as what he was doing because he was going up and doing atheist material. Now, the minute you announce to the audience that you're an atheist, you have lost all but 14% of the audience because everybody believes in something. But, but just in case you happen to be a name comic like George Carlin was or Bill Maher, who was a known atheist, the people that go there, they know who you are and they go and pay to see that. But if you're fucking nobody from nowhere doing that, that's a ballsy premise. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's... Uh... You know, it's not just racial humor that is risky to do on stage. I mean, religious, uh, I don't really do a lot of religious jokes, but, uh, you know, the, the few times I've done jokes about me being an altar boy and not being molested, you could tell it's like, hey, man, we don't joke about yep. that here. Um, Wouldn't want to do that in club. But, I mean, it's, it's true. I mean, you know, I was an altar boy in the eighties, which was in the Catholic priest land. That was the wild West. I mean, you know, I'm not even trying to be funny, but like I started looking back at, you know, I went to a hardcore Catholic grade school. Like it was like Alcatraz. Uh, uh, and I remember some of the priests just disappeared. Like they just, they were transferred to another parish or they just, and I'm talking about seniors, not just the low level priest. And now I look back and go, oh, and I still wasn't molested. And the crowd's just like, uh, not not tonight, dude. Like, we don't think so. <laughs> I mean, are What's there any are, are there any like topics that are taboo to you? I mean, 30 years into comedy that you're like, nah, I'm not gonna even try it. I don't even try it. Most of the times on that, like I would say, atheism would be the top of the list. Right. Anything religion is right next to it. People are just very wedded to that. Uh, other than that, no, I mean, anything's open. I, I mean, like right now, this, I cannot believe we're back on trending about OJ. I wonder how many hack comedians from 30 years ago are dredging up their OJ material and recycling it for the next couple of weeks. You're looking at one of them. Uh uh, yeah i i'm guilty but i mean i have a, an excuse because uh, i actually knew him like he was my neighbor growing up so I, I do have some funny stories about him and my dad and me playing catch in our yard uh, you know and you know, just like how many people can say they played catch with oj as a kid but uh you know he was nice to me i got no problem with him i mean I think Nicole and Ron committed suicide myself, but like, uh, <laughs> but he's I like, think... I mean, OJ is like the Rosetta Stone of, of jokes. Like to me, I could hear any comic do OJ jokes and laugh because of just the sheer buffoonery of that trial and all the characters and just how oj acted after he got off you know just playing golf every day <laughs> like yeah i'm on the search for the real killers i think they're on the seventh hole at pinmar uh yeah. 
Like to me, it's not hacky. It's such an obvious joke, but sometimes those are the best jokes. Like to me anyway, like. I agree. I agree. I mean, I recycled mine, which was uh, that I was I'm one of the few white people that was not happy to see OJ dead because I had plans for him. I wanted to put him on a reality TV show. I wanted to take OJ Simpson, Scott Peterson, put him in one house, call it Last Convict Standing. <laughs> Whoever comes out, kill Taylor Swift well, and the Kardashians. You can't kill the Kardashians. They're in too deep now. Uh, but, you know... It, if, well, we wouldn't have them. That trial made them. Yeah, and the sex tape with Ray J. Like, really... I mean, those two things. I mean, that's how... That gives me hope, though. I sit there and go, okay, if the Kardashians, and I don't hate on them, I don't know them, it's not personal, but they have no talent. Like, they literally, what is their talent? Uh, that their dad was a lawyer for OJ, and, you know, Kim could suck a big hog. And then they've literally made, bil maybe not billions, but probably close to it. Uh, so that gives like guys like you and me hope that are actually talented. All we got to do is suck a big black dick and we're in. God, I just can't think of anything I would want less than that. Or I would want badly enough to do that. Yeah. Now, I, big one. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't I don't want it that bad. I'd rather. I don't. And when I'm hearing all of the latest where it turns out that just about everybody who's got a big name is either into uh, trafficking, human trafficking or pedophilia. And you have to do whatever kind of compromising material you have to do in front of whatever acts are in front of you. And it, that's where Matt Rice's name came up on something I saw the other day that it was claimed he did that. And Cat Williams came out with that big, long list of people that did that. And I don't know. I don't know how true it is. I do know that just as I mentioned earlier, when I started out as an actor, it was uh, mid eighties. I came to Hollywood and I was, I had little media. I had, you know, B movie credits, soap opera appearances, national, regional, commercials, things like that. But I was still nobody from nowhere with no big name. And even at that level, I had the casting couch offered to me no less than five times. And it was never once from a fucking woman. Never once. So I'm the first one to believe that when powerful men get into those positions, if they can do something like that, they will. So I believe it happens now. Who does it or how much reality? I have no fucking idea. Well, I think in the Matt Rice story, it was walked back. The guy took it back real fast because I think Matt or Matt's legal team or whoever, his manager, said, hey, we're going to sue your ass. Uh, and he's like, oh, uh, it didn't happen. I was just kidding around. <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, oh, is that how they ended up? Yeah. Is that really? You saw the same thing I did, right? The guy that yeah. claimed that the two of them were. Yeah. I don't even know who the guy was. He claimed he was a comic of some stature, and I'd never heard of him. Had you? No, and like when I always say when someone brings up a comic, hey, do you know, uh, I don't know, Joe uh, Santorelli, he's been doing comedy for 15 years in L.A. I'm like, I've never heard of him. And that's not a good sign because, uh, you know, you know, just not. But apparently the guy's story was him and Matt walked into an office. Two agents said, we'll give you viral fame if you um, get on your knees right now. And he said, I left, but Matt was still on his knees. And then two days later he was uh i was just kidding around so uh i hope yeah, he i hope he sues the guy because like you know that's... unless the is if it really did happen it happened i don't know and uh, all i can say is that when i saw that the first thing i thought of is this guy either better be telling the truth or he's going to get hammered for slander or door number three is that it is the truth, and those who are in power said, you're going to cease and desist right now. But the one thing we both agreed on is he claimed in that statement that he was a renowned comic along with Matt Rice, and both of us just said we'd never fucking heard of him. Yeah. So, I mean, once again... I mean, I had heard of Matt, you know, for years. Uh, you know, I'd always see his flyers for the Laugh Factory show he did with his friend Paul, and uh, but, like, I always tell people, if I've never heard of them, they're probably not doing comedy because i got my ear to the ground so um but you know but libel and slander is very hard to uh prove so you know absolutely right absolutely right but that one would be a fucking slam dunk in a court of law because anytime you get into those you're right that they are hard to prove but 
all you need in a civil trial like that is the preponderance of the evidence. It's not beyond reasonable doubt like a criminal trial. So if you go there and show that tape and say, OK, now how many people here beyond any kind of preponderance of the evidence would say that this is slander? And I think, well, what? We're done now. You want to go to Bordier, but we're done because that, that's a guilty verdict. He was guilty. That was either true or, like I said, he, he was either lying or somebody got to him and said, uh, you better claim it was bullshit. I don't know which one it was, and I really don't give a fuck. It's Matt Reif's career right now, and I'm not going to hate on him in any way. And if that guy did that, fuck him. I hope he got what he deserved. If it was true and he got bought off or scared off, uh, that's just the nature of the business. Oh, I would say I'm, I'm very I hold grudges, as you know. So like if that I mean, I looked into suing an ex who had told people I threw her down a flight of stairs and, you know, I, it's, I don't even have a side of the story. It's like, no, it didn't happen. And so I ret actually retained a lawyer. He's like the best libel guy in L.A. And he's like, listen, I believe your story. I've done some, uh, I think I paid him five grand for a retainer. And he's like, you know, I'll, I'll do some digging. Long story short, he's like, you know, she has a pattern of uh, when she breaks up with someone, she goes into accusatory mode. So I believe you, but I'm not who you're trying to convince. You got to convince a judge and a jury, exactly what she said. And I mean, to the letter and you have to prove who she said it to. And then you got to get them to flip on her. So it, it's a hard case to win in this case, but in the Matt Reif case, it's in print what he said. Uh, yeah. So, um, like you said, I would imagine it, it's a lot easier to win that. Um, that, that was some pretty hard, pun intended. That yeah. was. Well, but you know like once it, things go viral on twitter like uh, you know it's it's all it takes is for one person of significance to retweet let's just say i said uh roger rod hit me backstage and uh i don't know, say russell peters tweets it out i stand with earl you're fucked like i agree and you can't that's you cannot deny a negative when something like that happens you are fucked no matter what you do if you try to protest it thou doth protest too much if you say nothing well he's got to be guilty look he hasn't said a word it's like richard gear and the gerbils who the fuck knows what ever happened there is it did it really happen or not you can't deny a negative and that's that's a position that being a nobody, sometimes it pays off because I don't fortunately knock on wood have that kind of shit going on. I don't have exes that are saying I shoved him down a flight of stairs. Well, you must have really lit that poor bitch up and made her want some more. Uh, well, you know, I still to this day don't know. Uh, I, I probably have never treated a woman better than I did that particular person. Like, uh, so I, I, you know, when people would ask me about it, I'd be like, no, it didn't happen. It, like, that's, is that's anybody story. that Girl, by any chance? What was that? It was that anybody that happened with it I might know. Uh no, I don't think you knew this one. Um Okay, good. Because I wouldn't want to think of, of that person as being the one. No, no, me and Gail get along great. Uh <laughs> oh that's that's the name I didn't want to say. No, she, we that, I mean that we share a dog still, but you know, um but you're right, you bring up something like in my case, you know, people it started making the rounds in the L.A. circuit. And uh, luckily, my reputation of being forget my comedy reputation. You know, people think you're funny or, or you're not. You have the same right. to uh, Roger's great. Oh, he sucks. Earl sucks. He, no, he's great. But uh, my reputation as a human really saved me because they're like everyone came up to me. was like, nah, man, we know you didn't do it. Like you're a lot of things, Earl, but you're not that. But after a while, I was like, started having to, I mean, like I said, I don't have a story. I'm like, no, it didn't happen. But I had to start speaking up about it because, you know, if you, you hit it perfectly on the head. If you're accused of something and you say nothing, people either think, oh, he's so confident that people don't believe that person that why say anything? But some people are like, he's hiding something. He's not saying anything. Um, and then if you, it's and the opposite. If you speak out too much, oh, he's hiding something. He's trying to cover up, you know. So it's, you can't win in a. It is a no win, and 
uh, there's a place that I work out at in uh, right here in Burbank, Burroughs High School. They have a fantastic track, football field, and bleachers. And I like to run the bleachers there, but it's a high school, and they're kind enough to open it to the public. But I'll tell you the honest to God truth, I am terrified of young people in high school or younger at that age. And when I go there, I have my head down and I stay 15 to 20 feet away from any group of high school kids because all one of them has to do is say that I said or did something inappropriate. I'm guilty and I'll never, never lose that stink. Regardless of what happens in a courtroom, oh, he's a kid fucker and you, you just can't shake that. So, I mean, I'm very, very frightened of the way we are as far as the media being what it is shoved down your throat. You can't deny a negative. And God forbid that uh, that happens to either one of us if we ever get to where we're trying to get, because I would hate to carry that moniker around. Yeah, I mean, there's no turning back with that. Like, it's just, uh, no. you know, once it's out, I had a friend of mine. I'll tell you who he is off off the uh, off the old podcast record, but you know he was accused of sexual assault, and it was a very similar situation to mine, where it's just a bad breakup. You yeah, know, girl said, you know, and guys are guilty too of saying shit after a breakup, but like in this case, the girl, um, I think he had cheated on her, so she's like, "Fuck this guy," I'm going to say he sexually assaulted me, and then. So everyone thought he was guilty, and and then she came out and said, uh, "I was just mad. He didn't do anything." And he told me after that, "I was like, I'm, I got to be honest with you, Earl. I kind of wish I did it because everyone thinks I did it. So why, you know, that's crazy logic to me, but I understood what he was saying. I get it. No, I very much get it. Yeah, that's. Uh, I don't know. I uh, I've I've been around long enough to have seen the amount of emotional train wrecks that exist in this business that both of us know about that when you hear of these outrageous stories, you know that the possibility is always on the table, just as the nature of not just people in general, but the fucking line of work that we chose. Oh yeah. Like, so. you know, like I give side hugs only now, whether it's an audience member who comes up to me after show, you know, our younger comic who, uh, you know, cause you know, at the store anyway, a lot of younger comics come to watch the shows and, you know, usually I'll do pretty good. And, you know, I rarely bomb. I mean, I, I do bomb at some, you know, probably one out of every, one out of every 50 shows I might bomb now. Um, but, you know, like you said, the like comedy club crowds, they're on your side. Like they want to see you laugh or they want to see you be funny because... Right. They paid a lot of money. They're they're rooting for you, and unless you know, you know, some crowds you just don't connect. It's it happens. Uh, but like a lot of younger comics will watch me, and I'm usually the oldest comic on the lineup anyway, unless uh, Argus is with me. Uh, so, uh, you know, they almost, you know, it's not daddy issues, but you know, it, it's oh, this older comic, he's kind of cool, and I ah uh, no. If we're in a room, I want the door open. I want people to see us. Like smart, I, smart. You know, I that's there, smart. There's a younger comic the other day. I don't know how she got back into the main room, green room. Uh, you know, which is it, it takes some doing to get into that green room. You got to really know where to go. Uh, and I, I was like, hey, you got to go. I, I don't. Let, I have a policy. I'm not alone with anyone these days. <laughs> like you got to go. Uh, now, 10 years ago, I'd be like, hey, shut the door. But uh, <laughs> that's if you had a couple of things we both like. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a crash course in the business. But uh, <laughs> I'll give you an open Earl. Forget the open mic. Um, but, you, <laughs> you know, I think as you get older, you, you learn uh, nothing's worth a piece of the puss puss. God. I've said it so many times that the the bad decisions I've made in my life, that's the best part about it, getting older as a man is you are no longer a slave to your dick. It doesn't do your thinking anymore. All of I those numbskulls. I mean, go ahead, finish your thought. No, I love being an older dude. Like I'm not, I love my age, uh, you know, from the standpoint of, 
yeah, you're right. You don't, you know, 10 years ago, I mean, I probably would have brought a girl back in the green room. Like, uh, yeah. But now it, it's like, uh, I just want to do my, I want to do like Anthony Jeslin, like does it. He shows up, does his set, he kills and leaves. Um, you know, he's a businessman. Like I, I'm not talking to anyone. I mean, he's, and he's a very nice guy, but like, he's very like, I'm here to work. This ain't a playpen for me. And that's why he's, more successful than 99.9% of the comics is it's a job to him. You could tell. Yeah. I have, again, nothing but respect for him as well. He's done very well. And he's one of the few white male comics that gets over the line the way he does. And I, when I see somebody going at that direction, I appreciate it. And whether I, would I love to be where he is? Yeah, but I'm not going to be the hater. I'm not going to be that guy. I'm, I, I was told many years ago, by somebody that was much wiser than me. I'm talking about when I first started and I was at one of those overrating myself stages. We all are when we first begin, we think we're better than we are. And I made some mention to a veteran guy about, uh, I can't believe this guy got that. I mean, Jesus, I mean, I'm better than he is. How did he? And he said, Hey, look, I'm rooting for everybody. I just want to get what I deserve. Wisest words I've ever heard. And I try to live by him. Oh yeah. I mean, I, you know, listen, are there some things I see that just drive me bonkers? Like some of the people who get on the Netflix is a joke festival. Like uh, a, a wrestler I know has a show. Like he's never done comedy before, and he's on a right. comedy festival. That and I, my friend who's a pretty big wrestler, he's like, Earl, don't worry about it. I'm like, yeah, but how would you feel if me as a comic who's never wrestled a day in his life before? took your spot on WrestleMania. I don't think you would like that. And he, he saw my point. Like, okay, I get it. But, uh, I mean, it's hard to not, when you see shit like that, it's like, oh, man. But, you know, I root for, I root for comics, I think, work hard. Like you, um, you know, uh, Adam Hunter, uh, you know, I'm not jealous of, you know, Adam Hunter's on uh, that Guffell show a couple times a week. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, because he deserves it. Adam, uh, he damn well deserves it. Not just because of how hard that he works. I think Adam is the best setup punch one liner comic in the game right now. Yeah, I mean he's definitely up there, and but you know he's put in the work, like you know, which is why once again I have no problem with Rife or uh, you know you you've put in the work. I mean you, you and I are still hoofing it at non comedy clubs, just the. To get the chops, absolutely, uh, absolutely. You know, and and there's probably, you know, Chris Riggins just got passed at the comedy store. You know, forty seven years old, or I think forty five or forty six. Like that's not a great age to, you know, get discovered. And and he works his ass off, and so I'm happy for him that he could be potentially taking my spots. I'm still happy for him. So. Um, you know, I guess we're all on our own journey and, you know, you and I probably couldn't have taken different paths. Um, I mean, if I did, uh, I, I did Larry Omaha's room in Montebello once. Now I was more Mexican than black. And, uh, you know, he's like, Hey man, thanks for coming out. I'm like, well, how do I do? He's like, well, I've never booked a Kennedy before. I'll say that. And that's all he told me. <laughs> Was that by any chance the Wild Coyote? Yeah, really. Well, yeah, it was. I didn't bomb me at the Wild Coyote. <laughs> I mentioned that one. They I used mean, to that... call that Mexican Apollo. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they were semi quiet for me. I didn't get heckled too bad. Uh, the guy before me, this Jewish comic, he was horrible. Uh, they did not like him at all. Like, you know, Larry also told me, he's like, hey, man, if I were you, I wouldn't stick around. You can leave now if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got no problem with that. I, I've never seen a white guy move so fast to get to his car. So, you know, it's a, it's a wacky I've had thing. More, I've had a few of those. I, 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 I was in a place in New York uh, that the, it's called the Bronx Barbecue. And uh, I had to get walked to my car by security. 
because I was literally, it was a, one of the hardest spots I've ever seen anywhere in New York, in the Bronx. And uh, it was probably somewhere around 500 people jammed into a, a barbecued restaurant that after the restaurant would close somewhere around midnight or one in the morning, there was a probably a three foot by four foot uh, plywood box in the middle of the room that was the quote unquote stage. And they would start the comedy show. And it was at the Madhouse. And I went up and I got into it so badly with some people in the crowd. Security had to walk me to my car. So, yeah, I've, I've seen that move. It's Comedy is not for the faint-hearted. I mean, I think, it, it is. I think the funniest story I ever had along those lines was I did some room in Compton, of all places. It was a like a Denny's type. It wasn't Denny's, but it was like essentially the Denny's of Compton. And I had a red car that I had a Dodge Magnum at the time. And I think I'd done an open mic with the guy who ran the room. He's like, hey, you're really funny. You want to headline a room? I'm like, no one was headlining me back then. So I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. It's in Compton. Oh, I don't care. I'll do fine. Don't worry about it. And uh, so I pull up in my Dodge Magnum and the security guard is like, uh, do you know where you are, sir? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm headlining the, the show in the back of the bakery or and he's like, uh, you're going to go on first. I'm like, no, no, I'm headlining, man. I'm getting paid a hundred bucks to headline. He's like, you're going to go on first. I'm like, why? Why? He's like, uh, this is a crip neighborhood. Uh, you or your car won't be here if you go on last. Uh, I'm like, you know what? I don't even have to go up. And I just took off. <laughs> <laughs> but it was my naivete of, yeah, I didn't put, you know, you can get... Like, I know friends of mine who are gang members or acquaintances, let me say that, uh, acquaintances. Uh, and, you know, they were they would tell me, like, when I would play golf at, at like, this certain uh, course in Long Beach, uh, they're like, you don't, you don't want to be here past 5 o'clock, you know, not looking like how you look like. But, you know, in the comedy vein, I was like, I don't care. I'll play a room in Compton. Fuck it. And, uh, I mean, you could get killed in these type of situations, Uh you know, it's not likely, but it, it's possible. Like uh, in a crip neighborhood, to drive up in a red Dodge Magnum, people have been killed for less, right? At the risk of sounding like I'm trying to one up you, which I'm not, I was wearing a red shirt in a show that I wasn't supposed to be wearing red and didn't know. And I went outside, and the car full of brothers rolled up with guns drawn on me. And they said, quote, unquote, what's up, what's up, what's up? And at that point, I said, uh, my fucking hands are up. That's what. <laughs> and I looked around it and uh, they said, what's your set? Yeah, what's your set? And I said, my set? Were you fucking Magnavox? What? What, what, uh, what set? Set of what? Set of speakers? What? And they're kind of looking at each other like, what did we just walk into? Because I was really outside of where the comedy show was going on. Right. And he said, so you you who you down with? You down with the you down with the bloods with that shit? Said, oh oh you dude, do I look like I'm in a fucking gang for you? Are you serious with this shit? And they kind of looked at each other and they kind of got bit by the humor bug a little bit. So they said, all right, get the fuck out of here. Don't wear that shit in here again. I wish when I said, here, how about this? I took the shirt off, wadded it up, and threw it on the sidewalk. You good now? We out, we okay with that? And they said, Yeah, we're good. And I went back inside the club with no shirt and did my set <laughs> and told everybody what happened. Well, I mean, it's so you're probably, right. Well, yeah, you can get killed for less. I mean, probably the closest I've ever come to getting killed was uh, my friend Norma was. Uh, we worked at the gym together, and she's like, "Hey, I had just started doing comedy," and she was like, "Hey, do you want to uh, do comedy at like a backyard party in Venice?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, it sounds fucking great." Um, ton, you know, tons of girls and. All oh, hundred bucks cash. I'm Jewish. I that I, I was on board, and At the pussy. Bro. I mean, you once again, <laughs> pussy can make a man do many things, and uh, so I, not knowing the neighborhood, and and you know, I had a red uh, Massimo hoodie on. Uh, it's one of my favorite jackets I've ever had, but it was bright red. And so uh, this area of Venice, now I know there's a lot of gangs in Venice, uh, you know, and I guess this was a shoreline crip neighborhood. Um, so we're walking up to the party and this 
it's like that scene in uh boys in the hood at the end where you know car pulls up and there very, it is very similar to your story and they're like uh i'll never forget they said hey blood nice jacket and i'm so fucking stupid i start walking toward the car and i'm about to say oh thanks guys and norma dragged my hand and we ran down an alley and we she knew the hood so like we we actually got back we got into the party but looking back i'm like that's probably the closest i've ever come to getting killed you know i mean and, and you know so you just read one out of me there was a place called mavericks flat on 43rd and crenshaw that's the place where i was mentioned earlier i'd met ari spears and i was waiting outside on the sidewalk for the line to get into the show when the car rolled up uh rolled down the windows and opened fire and that's when the brothers on the circuit realized that I wasn't the typical white guy that I was going to be. Hey, uh, let me get the license plate number on that. No, I hit the ground so fast. I had three Negroes on top of me. And that was my first experience with a drive by. So, yeah, I've actually seen one. When you look at this stuff, bro, we're, we're not we're not trying to make hard luck stories, but people have no idea the shit we go through. They ask, why are comedians so jaded? They have no idea what it takes to be when they see you crushing it at the comedy store in the main room on a weekend night. And they think, oh, this guy's got it made. No, they have no idea what the fuck you went through to get there. And you got oh. nothing but respect for me. Oh, likewise. I mean, we're, you know, I, I would say I've done comedy you know, 99. Maybe I started. So, you know, almost 25 years. You're probably longer than that. Uh, so because people... I'm older. Well, fuck, I'm right behind you, bro. Uh, but, like, you're right. People see you crushing at, at whatever room you're in. Uh, I've never seen you really bomb. And we've done some shit rooms, and you still did well. <laughs> we have. I mean, I can't, like, I can't keep up with the bad rooms I've played in. Like, I'll have a comic come up to me and say, hey, man, we did that shithole, and uh, you were really funny. I'm like, which one, bro? There's about 7,000 of them I've done. So, uh, but you don't, you just see that person crushing or, or killing or even just doing well. And you're like, oh, that's easy, man. They just got up there and winged it. Fuck, that's 25 years of work. That's set. Uh, yeah. So, but, and you still, like, I got uh, maybe, maybe about three or four months ago at the comedy stores, uh, Saturday night is really rowdy. Almost had a black room energy that night in the main room. I mean, they were amped up, and I, I don't want to say the word so this interview gets taken down. But uh, you know, I'm in the all leather outfits and this table full of Raider fans. Uh, you can just tell bad tattoos, bald. Uh, yell out, "Hey, take out those leather pants, you maggot!" and uh, I'm like, uh, you're with five dudes and two girls who look like dudes. And they stormed the stage. Like, they were ready to kick my ass. And, like, you started yeah, it. Yeah. So, luckily, the security guards. The great thing about the comedy store, I will give them full credit. You, back when we started, the security guards were comics, which are the worst security group to have. Because they want to watch a fight. They don't want to break it up. Um but now they're all professional. Like, like one guy worked in the Israeli military, and like <laughs> the, the female security guards, like a Krav Maga instructor. Uh, so I was lucky, but you know, you would think I'd be immune from shit like that at a major comedy club, but it still happens. No, yeah, it happens anywhere. No, when I uh, and you know, as far as bombing goes, when I first started comedy in '90. And uh, I was just probably about five or six shows into it. And this guy that had said to me when he was the only person I knew that was helping me, he said that you're not really able to be talked to as a comic until you've done a hundred shows. And uh, that was something that was like a yardstick where he said, at this point, it was like you can know everything, but I'll be able to talk to you in a way that you'll understand that I can't talk to you right now. And that made sense. So now I see one day in the San Jose Mercury, there's a story about the late, great Henny Young, king of the one-liners. And he said, 
a household name. He's the one that, for those of you who are younger, he's the one that said, take my wife, please take my wife. He was the <laughs> king of the one-liners. They called him. Big article about him in the San Jose, and it ended by saying, Henny is very personable. His number is listed in the New York directory, and he accepts all phone calls. I said, well, fuck this. Let me see how this works out. I picked up the phone. I called the number. And sure as hell, Henny Youngman came with a one line. I said, geez, it is you. And he, who is this? Well, this is Roger. Where are, where are you, Roger? Well, I'm in San Jose. Is that town still open? I mean, he gave me about 15 minutes of advice. And I asked him about, well, listen, this guy said the 100 shows. Does that really mean anything? Is that a viable term? And he said to me the words I've never forgotten. Kid, you're not a comedian until you've bombed a thousand times. Wow. Yeah. That's that's pretty solid when you think about it. Bombed a thousand times. I don't think I've got a thousand bombs, but I, I certainly have enough. I mean, I'm up there, like uh you know but like i think if you're in it i think you and i are in it for the right reasons i think if you're in comedy for money in los angeles you'll quit after two wrong months place. Like, wrong place there's just there is no money initially in comedy at all you're paying basically to do comedy you're you're driving Absolutely. Like I, I, I used to drive to San Diego on a Saturday night there was a coffee house there it was a basement show but it was packed no money, 10 minutes set. I did it for months. Um, yep. So that that was literally uh, 100 bucks each way in gas, food. Like I, I was two, at least 200 in the hole every time I did that show, but it was worth it to me. Uh, now I won't go east of Doheny. So, um, you know, it's, you, you learn to be more uh, selective in your gigs at our age, but uh i mean dude i could talk to you all day about comedy but i know you got to go so this Absolutely. is we both do this is i gotta say this i'll go this ahead is the most i've got to talk to you in a long long time and that alone made this very worth it to me it makes me sad though like when i look at the group that you you and i uh not necessarily started with but you know when we all kind of came together at the 32 and i'm I'm talking uh, Chris Ramirez and, uh, you know, Richie the C and uh, Ty Rivera and, and uh, Claude Stewart. And, uh, you know, I think Tripoli was in that group for a little bit. Uh, but then, you know, you kind of, you know, it's like in a college players who get drafted, I'm sure they lose touch with their teammates. You know, one guy goes to the Steelers, one guy goes to the Raiders. You know, you might, you know, see them at, if your teams are playing against each other or whatever, but like you lose track with the people you started with. And so uh, that's why I'm very honored to have have you on this show. And, um, you know, we're, we're two soldiers. We're like Rambo in the hardware store when it's never over. Well, the honor is very much mine. And I agree that uh, let's, let's just stay in touch, brother. A lot more than we have get but, together soon. Watch, watch a game, something it's been too long. But before you go, where can people find you online and uh, YouTube, all that okay. shit? But the only thing is, I'm gonna I'm gonna be posting this at some point. Uh, you're on Instagram, I know that. Have you seen this ten thousand ads they put out for Muscle and Fitness to be Mister Muscle and Fitness? Submit yourself for that. Yeah, I've I seen actually. It. Yeah, I, I if, when they didn't want money, I just said fuck it. One day I was bored at the gym in between sets. I filled it out, sent it in anyway. I'm in the competition and uh, I'm going to post something on that. But if you want to support me on social media, you'll be one of my eight followers, but it's lowercase only all one name, R O G E R R O D D. That's at Instagram. And the other is pretty much Roger R O G E R Rod R O D D on Facebook. And uh, my space is pretty much uh, still in my, no, it's not, I'm not kidding. I, I am kidding about that, but that's, that's, I, I'm not a big social media guy. But that's what I've got going. And wherever people have me that want me to be there, that's where I perform. Well, it would be an honor if there's any bookers watching this. And I do get some bookers who, you know, they like seeing comics chop it up. Like, you could do a lot worse than having Roger on your shows. I mean, he'll always deliver. He'll show up on time. Uh, of course, that means you got to pay him, which is foreign to some of you bookers. Uh <laughs> 
to the people listening, you know, it doesn't seem like much following a comic, but you know, it helps get us into the algorithm. Uh, are you, do you have a YouTube page at all or no? Yeah. Same name, Roger Rod. Yeah. And then you can see the kind of stuff I do. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, it subscribe to Roger's YouTube page, like his videos, you know, you might think, what does that really do? But you know, it gets Roger and guys like me into the algorithm and it helps us. So, uh, and if nothing else, occasionally you just get a nice comment and that makes our day as well. Yeah. Every comic likes to hear they're funny. Like, you know, absolutely. We, you know, there are some comics who sit there. I don't do comedy for the compliments or the attention. Bullshit. Cause if that, bullshit. Yeah. That was yeah. the case, you'd be doing comedy to your dog in the living room. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we all like to be told we're funny. Every single one of us. Absolutely. That's why we do it. You know, it's like Gene Simmons says, I don't care about the critics. I guarantee you Gene is the first guy to look up any review of a Kiss album. Like, the first. Bullshit. So, follow Roger Rod. He's truly one of my best and longest friends in L.A. comedy. And that's a statement in and of itself. It, Axl Rose was right. Whether you like Guns N' Roses or not, the song Welcome to the Jungle is the most true song about comedy that can be stated. We got your money, honey. We got your disease. We got anything wow. you want. Get on your knees. So, like, that's that's comedy in a nutshell. Bingo. The disease on. is the adrenaline of the laughter and the money that's they it. hold over our heads to do shit gigs. Thank you, Larry Omaha, Dave Tribble, <laughs> all you fucking vagabonds, awful, <laughs> awful people. Tr Tribble runs that we we'll talk about Tribble runs later. I I walked out you of the only one. I walked out of the only one I did. Yeah, uh, Earl, uh, there's no hotel covered on the off day, so just go to a strip club for a couple hours. Okay, Dave, you got it. <laughs> you fucking idiot. <laughs> Uh, Roger, <laughs> I hope to see you in person soon. Follow Roger Rod. He's one of the good ones in this game. And that is the latest episode of Inappropriate Earl. See ya!